Hey there guys, so uh, the name of the game today is Toroid Flowers. Um, I know I have played with these on this blog before, but uh, we had an interesting uh, kind of exchange of ideas at Summer Wildfire about these that produced new patterns I hadn't seen before and helped me kind of clarify my thinking on them and the metaphors that I was using to describe them. So I thought this would be a good opportunity both to kind of pull back together all of uh, the tricks that uh, involve them that I've done on this blog before, as well as show you guys some of the new patterns that came out of it. So, without further ado, um, toroid flowers. What are they? Well, technically speaking, I would argue that just about any flower that we can do could, under the right circumstances, be considered a toroid flower. Um, a toroid, of course, being um, essentially a donut, it's a tube that wraps back uh, upon itself. When we talk about it specifically in context of poi, however, we're talking about, um, classically, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, moving the hand and the poi, and having the poi rotate around the hand uh, at an axis that is orthogonal to the hand's movement, which the hand's movement, of course, loops back upon itself, uh, creating an ellipse or a circle. Now, um, the way I've been kind of visualizing this is imagining an observer who is sitting on a moon or a planet as it's orbiting around another mass and the kind of uh, path that they're going to trace through space as, as, as they're sitting down for this ride. Um, how, l l let's say for the sake of argument that uh, we've got an observer who is sitting on the moon. Um, and specifically they're sitting on the moon, on the equator, on the side not facing towards the earth and they're just going to sit there and uh, watch what happens uh, while the moon completes one rotation around its axis. Uh, that path through space is going to look something like this if the poi head uh, is the position of that observer. If we were to do some vertical plane, it looks like this. The reason for this is that the moon has a uh, uh, a, a rotational period, that is the amount of time it takes for it to rotate around once on its own axis, that is equal to its orbital period, that is the amount of time it takes it to complete one orbit around the Earth. The upshot of that is that it means that the same side of the Moon is always faced towards the Earth. Now, this observer who's sitting on the Earth will see a sunrise and a sunset, and they'll see all the planets moving around and everything. The one thing they won't see is the Earth. Um, Likewise, a, a observer who's sitting on the bright side of the moon will see the Earth all the time, but all the planets and the sun and everything uh, go up and down in the sky. Um, if, however, the observer who is sitting on uh, the moon's equator on the far side decides that they want to go for a walk, and specifically they want to have that walk go along the moon's equator, let's say uh, clockwise because it's the same direction that the moon rotates around uh, the Earth as seen from the North Pole, fact check me on that one, um, and they're going to complete that hike such that they're getting around the Moon uh, twice in the amount of time it takes the Moon to complete an orbit around the Earth, in which case their path looks like this. This is a one pedal in spin. And now they're actually getting to see the Earth. If they wanted to walk counterclockwise around the Moon, however, Hang on, let's keep it consistent. This is the path that they'll follow through space. This is a triketra. Now they get to see the Earth three times. Now, in both of these cases, all of the points that exist to create a torus exist, but the observer is choosing to only follow a path that has a cross-section that is parallel to the path of the moon uh, along uh, its, its, its orbit, right? which means that, by and large, the North and the South Pole were never really using. What if instead that observer um, were sitting at the South Pole and they wanted to walk from the North Pole back to the South Pole uh, along uh, a 180 degree separated uh, set of lines of longitude? And now let's say that they're making that hike and uh, doing it four times in the time it takes them to complete one orbit around the Earth. In which case, their, their, uh, their path is going to look more like this. which, like I said, is the more classical kind of uh, toroid flower shape. 
Uh, now, as they walk from north to south, they're moving along an axis that is orthogonal to the moon's path through space. Cool. Um, things get a little bit more interesting, though, if we add some kind of movement on the planetary body's part. Um, so, for the, for the most part, when we do this, we're imagining a fictional kind of scenario. One in which the planet in question is rotating on its axis in the opposite direction uh, that it's rotating around uh, the, the body that it's orbiting around. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that this can't happen in nature, but we'll just, for the sake of argument, say that's the way it is, and we're just using it as a, as a thought experiment. Now, that same observer who's walking from the north to the south pole and back again, uh, all the long lines of longitude that are 180 degrees separated, is going to follow a path that looks more like this. And this observer has something in common with this observer. Neither of them ever see the planet that they're orbiting around. The reason for this being that as the um, as the moon is rotating, and let's say it's moving counter, it, it, let's say it's moving anti-spin, it's always sending them back out towards outer space. And when they come back around, it's swinging past the planet in such a way that uh, they never uh, seem to come to the inside of the torus. Uh, the interesting thing about that is, if you were to see it purely from the perspective of the torus, it looks like the path they're tracing is almost like a three-dimensional pendulum. That is, it always seems to be going back and forth across the same section uh, that is the outside of the torus. Whereas to the observer, they, they think they're doing the exact same thing as this guy. Walking from the north to the south pole, the only thing that's changed is where the planet shows up in the sky to them. Okay, so um, we, we've been calling this latter circumstance an anti-spin, and here's why. Uh, if you look straight down the, uh, the plane of the poi, uh, you can imagine this as being almost like a, a straight line, right? Now, as the plane is uh, moving through this uh, toroid kind of shape, in the first example, it's moving like this, such that uh, the same end of it is always faced towards the inside. In that latter example, however, it shifts like so. And if we imagine the straight line that that plane creates, as being metaphorically similar to a club or a staff as it's creating one of these shapes, then by gum it looks like it's going anti-spin. Now, in, in terms of toroid flowers, we've been calling this in-spin for a while now, when if we're going to actually use that metaphor, it would be more aptly called extension or isolation. There is an in-spin version of the same thing that looks like this, but it is both rather ugly and kind of difficult to do, so I'm not going to demonstrate it right now. But just suffice it to say, that's, that, that, that's the two sides of those coins. Now, really, really interesting things start happening when you play with these, uh, the, these anti-spin variants. Um, one of which is an example that I showed in a tech blog a few weeks ago, which is imagining that there are three points that you're moving between, right? Like so. Now, um, when you put this in vertical, it looks just like one of these Arashi-style uh, plane bent shapes. That's because it is one. Um, when you're performing these Arashi-style moves, Arashi, excuse me, um, in such a manner, they could be considered to be uh, toroid flowers. Um, what's really, really, really funky about this is, uh, in, in that same blog where I started playing with these, I realized that you could treat each of these corners as cross points in a weave, right? In which case you wind up with a weave that has three different cross points around the body. And the same thing is true if you're doing vertical. Here's why this is so funky. Now, if I were to just isolate a part of this particular uh, uh, anti-spin toroid weave, I'd be doing what we all recognize to be a 3D weave, right? If I continue my way around, I wind up with a 3D weave at another corner and 3D weave at another corner, right? 
Now, if I'm just oscillating between two points here, um, I'm basically only taking up part of that torus, but moving the poi back and forth along paths that all exist in. It's just a different way to slice it. Um, but we, we, we've seen this kind of metaphor before in terms of flowers wherein the planes are parallel to the plane of the hand, and that is these circumstances, caps. Now, we use caps to switch between extensions in different kinds of anti-spin flowers usually, which offers up the very, very tantalizing possibility that we can likewise think of weaves as a way of breaking up some of these toroid flowers and switching between them in various sundry ways, right? Fascinating. Um, there's also one other place that we took this metaphor over the weekend, which um, th this is something that David Freger and I got into on, uh, on Friday night, which was the idea of what if we, instead of taking classic planetary motion, take a planet that is a notable exception to just about every role, in this case Uranus. Uh, and what makes Uranus so special is that its axis it, that it rotates around itself on is plopped over on its side. Uh, so to stick this in a vertical plane, if we were to take this same idea of walking from the south to the north pole and back again on Uranus, the plane that we're following twists through space like this. Weird. So, David and I took this idea and decided to try and see what would happen if we made a point to it. So what we wound up uh, with is basically this pattern, where we start up top with the poi rotating forwards in, in wheel plane, and then counterclockwise in wall, reverse in, uh, in, in wheel plane, clockwise in wall, and then back to forwards. And the result wound up being, ooh, this funky beastie. And the idea here is that we're plane bending in such a way that we wind up rotating the plane counterclockwise if you look down at it from above with every iteration around the circle. The path of it looks a little bit like a strand of DNA that's been twisted around to meet back up with itself. To which we then took the idea of, okay, what if we have two observers on this particular planet? One of them starts from the North Pole, one of them starts from the South Pole. And they're going to both go across the planet, but they're going to do so on lines of longitude that are separated by 90 degrees instead of 180 degrees. That way it's not the same line of longitude. And then life got really interesting. And we wound up in a position where each the segments of this flower winds up being an atomic, which totally matches all the points of the toroid flower, but in a vastly different way. I apologize, this is not remotely clean. We're still working on making it so. Ooh. Yeah, so um, part of the reason for doing this video is realizing how many possibilities there are out there for what we can do inside of the Taurus and to challenge you, my viewers, to uh, come up with your own paths that you can walk across different planets and see what the results wind up being when you have a boy follow those paths. So, uh, thank you guys for watching. I'll be heading to Burning Man next week, so uh, there will be no video, but do expect in the week after a whole button of uh, videos of some of your and my favorite spinners spinning fire on the playa. And until then, thank you all for watching, and have yourselves a great weekend. Peace.